Hello, this is the IMP Intermediate Lesson on Premiere, and I'm Tina LeBaron. We're going to continue where we started with Beginner, and if you already know some of the basic skills, which are importing, making a sequence, using the razor blade tool, using your source window to get your clips in, you should be okay. We also did some basic text, and you can look at the notes that are provided to see if there's anything you might have missed from that introduction. We're going to start by adding some music to this, and you can get music on a number of different ways. Some students just bring in whatever they have and don't care about the YouTube copyright. We'll see how that goes. I do usually use this opportunity to talk about royalty-free music, and we do those searches. It's also a great time to bring in that Creative Commons interface. And some of the favorite sites of students are like Incomtech and Ben Sound and such like that. So they can look for royalty-free music, just being aware that whenever they do a Google search for royalty-free music, it doesn't always just come up with royalty-free. The other fun opportunity, I think, for them is if they're in a band or they have any friends that are in a band, sometimes they can bring their music in. So I'm going to do that. I have a band. I have my window over here. So I'm just going to click and drag and put it in Premiere Tutorials. If I want to overlay this sound underneath, I can just drag it to the clip. I can also double click and see it like I did the video clips. Only this time, if you notice, I have the only drag audio option. In. And click and just drag audio. One thing my students always do is they'll put the audio track in and then let it run the whole time. So if we go to the end of this by using the end key, we'll see it's three minutes, where my actual video, sorry, is only about one minute and it's not quite cut down yet. Using the razor blade tool and make sure I cut that so that the music ends at the same time. That way I don't have a three minute export on a one minute video. This is pretty loud. And so if I wanted to decrease the volume, I can do an overall mix on it, which would change the volume of everything. I can double click on it, and in my effects controls, I'll see the volume here. I can also click and go to the audio mixer. And right now I have an audio too, because that's what's selected. If I click everything, I'll see all the audio tracks in my scene. So if I decided audio track two should be decreased, I'll make sure I hit that home key so I'm at the beginning of the clip, and I'll just click and drag it down. If you prefer the other option in effects controls, with that selected, if you're like, oh, I forget which track is which, you can click here. You'll see it went down to level eight. You can also click and drag here to decrease. And then if I play, so we're seeing it's getting to about a negative 12. I think with how I recorded the audio, I probably want that to get down to about a negative 24. So let's go ahead and maybe pick like a negative 10. See where that ends up for me. That's all right. And that's one way I can do the audio. If I wanted my voice to then be louder, I could double click on that, go to the same effects controls or go to the audio mixer, audio clip mixer, increase that, and then my voice should be louder. We're going to capture the game right now. I'm still only getting to about a negative six. I'd like to see that more at about a negative three with the settings I'm working. So I'll go ahead and turn that up a little more. The big thing is that your zero is like your highest level mix. After that, if it gets to the red, it's peaked. You always want it to be at zero or below. In kind of old school, it used to be that um, kind of voices and such like that were mixed at around negative 12. So the explosions would really have that gravitas. What happened was some commercial people figured out that, you know, you could just make everything as loud as possible because there wasn't a difference. That's why when you're watching TV, the commercials are so much louder. So we started mixing our vocals up a little more if we didn't have those huge explosions or anything going on. At least that's what I was told if I've been lied to, uh, sorry, UMBC. If we wanted to hear what the vocal sounded like without this audio track, we could go ahead and mute it. We could also hit solo. That'll actually just play the one audio track I have selected. So we're going to capture the game right now. I have a lot of hum in that track. I could fix that, hopefully, by going to my effects and going to audio effects. My favorite filter in this 
is kind of a smart filter. It's denoise. We could do de hum and reverb, de reverb separately, but I normally put on denoise and it does a pretty good job of cleaning up all those background noises. So we're going to capture the game right now. Some people think it sounds a little uh, kind of too hollow or sometimes too tinny. I like it, but you can play around with some of the other denoise or noise reduction. If you're looking for those really traditional EQ filters, they're all here. So if you want to manually edit every part of it, you can do your low pass and your high pass to get rid of those. You can go to your parametric equalizer. I find a lot of times denoise does a pretty good job for quicker, so meeting those student schedules. This is my favorite. I do think sometimes it turns the audio down. I'll go through and bump the decibels up by one. So if it's like a 7.2, I might do an 8.2. On the newest update, I'm finding that doesn't happen as much as it used to. So we're going to capture the game right now. Okay, I think that's all right. If I wanted, I can also lay the track down by hitting this button right here, the record voiceover. When you do this, if your computer speakers are on, it will get, you know, it'll catch on your microphone and create one of those like wah, 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 and uh, lots of reverb. So whenever you're using this, I would turn your computer audio all the way down. Then what we can do is we can hit this It'll give us a countdown, three, two, one. Now I can go ahead and lay over the voiceover. It will record and I'll get a track that I'll be able to edit afterwards as well. It won't build until I stop though, so let me go ahead and stop. <laughs> so I definitely wanna mute that. Whoop, not record over it. Mute it. I can go ahead and lay over the voiceover. I'm still getting some of that hum. <laughs> I think that's just honestly my computer, so I'm going to throw another denoise on it. And I'll play to make sure those levels are about the same. We'll have to. That's a six. And lay over. They are not at all the same. So let me go back to my mixer. Ooh, I already adjusted on my level two here, so I'll have to make it clip specific. And that is another way you can determine which one you want to use. And I could keep playing with this. Honestly, maybe a 6.5 would be a little better. And I won't make you sit there and suffer through me hitting all the buttons, but do know that with your students, you will want to give them some time and remind them that audio and editing take just as long as filming. Like they'll film until, at least mine, film until the last day. We can also adjust the color. And the same color values, the same color grading you saw exist in this program. It's going to be in video effects. You can also just search Lumetri. There's a bunch of Lumetri presets right here. And my students want to go to this all the time. They're like, okay, I'll just do this. It does it for me. These tend to be highly layered. And when I put them on, you're going to see a lot, a lot of layers and how much color correction it might've done. This was a two strip. And so I find just using these presets, especially if your computers aren't the fastest, can really choke what's happening. Plus you want them to learn how to do the color values themselves instead of just using a preset all the time. So instead you're looking for Lumetri color. You physically drag Lumetri color on your clip. Let's say I wanted this to be brighter, more vibrant, maybe a little warmer. I can double click on my clip and then in the effects controls, I'll see Lumetri color. Our basic color correction is going to be a lot of what you probably recognize from like Photoshop. You can adjust the temperature if I want it to be a little warmer. I can adjust the tint, the saturation. So maybe I want the saturation just a tiny bit more. This does not have great saturation guard though. So if you put it up too high, it, the image will break apart a fair amount. Not quite as much as I think it does in Photoshop, but it will still break apart. Uh, we can also adjust our exposure, contrast, and you can see the rest. You also have curve control. So if you decided you wanted to change just one object, like I want to go ahead and say in the middle, I want the reds to be a little brighter. I can go to this curve, which was right here. It was this carrot. Click here in the middle, and I can kind of up my mid-range reds. I find with curves, at least in color correction, less tends to be a little more. 
So adding too much, I think, can be distracting, but it does depend on the clip. That didn't add anything. There we go. Better. There is, if your students really want to experiment with some of the presets, this creative option. This is where you can adjust with your film fade settings. Sharpen, vibrance, if you want to adjust vibrance. And your saturation is here again. It's a slightly different type of saturation. This one really uh, goes, goes a little bigger. But for those presets, they have ones that are look. And the look is going to design it to look more like film or other effects, other cameras that are out there. So if we know we want this to look a little more like this Fuji film, we can click. It'll color correct to look more like that Fuji film. If there's SLs, if we want an SL Noir, it's going to make it more black and white. If you are someone who used to use the three-way color corrector and really misses it, and you're like, where did it go? I've been searching, I can't find it. It's actually here in color wheels. This is the same as your three-way color corrector where you can go ahead and adjust the amount of shadows and kind of add those tints to the shadows or the midtones or the highlights. It's just in with everything else now, which honestly I think might make it a little easier to get the color correction that you want quicker. If you get really into this, you want to see more like the Lumetri scopes, what's going on with your actual color system and color correction. You can go to workspaces and in color, it will change to a color correction interface. And you can see where those color values are as you go to your different scenes. And you can see how much more color and how much more saturation I have here than here. You can also see that a lot more of it is starting to go off the screen. So if, especially I was exporting to old media, I was trying to get it on the web, I might lose some colors. If this were like VHS days, there'd probably be too much information up here. And that's what used to cause those little wiggles at the top or the bottom of the VHS screen too. It was sometimes your tracking was wrong, but sometimes this color saturation was so bright it was getting into signals it wasn't supposed to get into. Hopefully that helps for your intermediate for Premiere, and we'll come back with Advance next time.